I saw a bumper sticker this week, and it said, Jesus is the reason for the season. You saw that same car, huh? <laughs> Jesus is the reason for the season. But is he? Is he the reason for the season because we say it with our lips or because we live it with our lives? If you got your Bible, join me in Luke chapter 2, a familiar portion of Scripture as we step out of Thanksgiving and begin to walk towards Christmas. But I think this morning, my hope, my prayer is to lead us in a message that would really challenge how we look at Christmas, perhaps in a fresh and new way than ever before. Now, Luke chapter 2, notice what the Bible says. This is towards the end of this chapter. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, now we're still in Luke chapter 2, where many of us will read during the Christmas celebration. Jesus has moved from being a baby born in a manger, from a toddler, uh, to being elementary age. Now he's 12 years old. He's getting ready to become a teenager, right? He's a, he's a middle schooler. And the parents are doing what many of you do as parents. You want him to, to grow and to know God and to have him in the right kind of place and to be around the right kind of people. Uh, notice Notice verse 43. After the festival was over, after church was over, so to speak, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. It's kind of like today, right? You all load up in your SUV, and you're headed home, and it's kind of quiet in the back. And you look back, and you say, where's, where's Junior? Why? I thought you went to go check him out of Hope Kids. What do you mean? You had the sticker. I thought you were going to check him out of Hope Kids, right? And you're like, what? Where, where, where is he? You start texting. Hey, your parents, right? Hey, Grandma and Grandpa, did, did you take Junior home? I mean, where, where, where is he at, right? They don't know where Jesus is. <laughs> Verse 44, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. What does that say? You can go a whole day and not know where your kid is right? Uh, then, they, then they began looking for him amongst their relatives and friends, and when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem uh, to look for him. You pull back into the church parking lot. You're hoping the doors are still open, right? After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting amongst the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. A better, better translation of that word is they are perplexed. They're upset. You can see it next. His mama said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Anybody have a 12-year-old? 13? Anybody have a kid? Why, 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 what were you thinking? Why did your father and I have been anxiously searching for you? And notice the response of Jesus. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. And so my hope is, in our time together this morning, is that you and I won't lose Jesus this Christmas. Or better stated, that we'll walk off this campus or wherever you are joining us online we will step out into the next 28 days as we walk towards Christmas, and we will make a conscious decision to make Jesus Christ the center and the point of Christmas. But if we get honest this morning, sometimes Christmas actually draws us away from Christ rather than draws us to him. All the activity, right, all this, all the school events, work parties, your shopping, all the different Hallmark movies that you've got to watch. I mean, it just, it gets complicated, and now they built WEC, and now you got to go out to WEC and see all the lights out at WEC. I mean, it just seems like, oh my goodness, how do we fit all of this in? Jesus, here in Luke chapter 2, he's a 12-year-old boy. 
the irony of this story is they're going up to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. We know from the end of the story that Jesus becomes the Passover lamb. They lose Jesus in a celebration that's all about Jesus. And that can happen to us as well. Christmas is his birthday, but we get distracted, don't we? We get distracted by all the different type of activities and even religious celebrations. We can lose him. It's possible to lose Jesus right in the middle of the Christmas story. I mean, think about it. Mary and Joseph, like they lost Jesus. Now, stick with me for a minute. It wasn't that much long. I mean, it was just a few years earlier, that, like the whole virgin birth thing, remember? Right? All of a sudden, whoa, wait a second. I'm pregnant. Angel, Mary, what's conceived in you is from God above. Yo, Joe, I'm pregnant. God's done it. Joe, I'm going to divorce her. Angel, listen, don't. This is a good thing that's going on. You would think the extraordinary events of the conception of Jesus, they got their eye on Jesus. He ain't getting out of my sight. I'm just telling you, this is special. I'm what? Then throw in the whole wise men coming and giving all the presents. Throw the whole shepherds into the story. Like, Jesus ain't never getting out of their sight. The last people in the world that we would have thought would have lost Jesus. Lost Jesus. Now, I want to make something really clear this morning, all right? I'm not talking, in 2022, I'm not talking about you and I losing our salvation or losing our relationship with Jesus. Mary is still Jesus' mama. Joseph is still Jesus' daddy. I want to make this clear. My salvation is not lost, right? I'm not talking about losing my salvation. I'm talking about how we can lose his presence. The Bible makes it clear in John chapter 10, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. Nobody, including you, no human entity, nothing can take us away from Jesus. When you made a decision to lean in and trust God as your Savior, in Okinawa, Japan, as a Marine, when I started that relationship with Jesus, nobody on this side, including me, I can't get so stupid and do something so sinful that somehow, you know, God says, yo, Abraham, Isaac, come here, boys. Look at Cummins. He done got stupid. Boom, we're kicking him out. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and that it's not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I didn't do anything to earn my salvation. I, I didn't cross enough religious T's and dot enough spiritual eyes that God says oh look at come let's invite him in right no no not at all it's all about Jesus I can't earn it and if I can't earn it there's nothing that I can do to lose it I am 100% confident there's a lot of things in life I'm not confident about but I will tell you one thing that I'm confident about is that when I take my last breath on this side of heaven, I'm taking my next breath in heaven in the presence of Jesus because Jesus Christ is my Savior. He died for my sins. I have been forgiven. I am redeemed. I have been adopted into his family. It's not about what I could have done or should have done and wouldn't have done. It's all about Jesus. I'm going to be in a real place called heaven one day. I am 100% confident. You don't lose your salvation, your relationship, but I'm telling you this morning, you can lose proximity. You can lose his presence. It is possible to love Jesus and lose his presence. We get distracted. We get distracted by things that are happening, right? It's, it's, it's just, you know, things are happening in life. You got the bills and the cadence and all the different things. And if we're not careful, Jesus can get lost or Jesus begins to cramp our style in the whole North American kind of way of celebrating Christmas, distracted by religious celebration. How did that happen? Remember it said that they're, they're on their way, they've been traveling, and, and, and all of a sudden they kind of look around and said, hey, where is, where is Jesus? Jesus with you? Is you I, I. They assumed, they assumed that Jesus was with them you get distracted by all kinds of things and you assume kind of like 
the Ohio State Buckeyes yesterday at halftime, they assumed they, they were going to just step out and the University of Michigan was going to be like, oh, those Buckeyes are so strong and so fast and so good. They look so cute in their uniforms. Let's not even play the second half. I'm telling you, when you assume, you lose. When you assume in your marriage, you assume in your kids, you assume in your business, you assume in your finances. And when Mary and Joseph assumed that Jesus' presence was with them, they lost Jesus. I wonder how many of us, in all your good intentions, you love them, you sing the songs, you have all the things, but if we got honest for just a moment, you've presumed that somehow you can sprinkle a little Jesus on your Christmas, and somehow that will be good enough. They lost Jesus, and they didn't even know it. They, they, they thought that they could, they could garnish their religious activity with his presence. We think we can garnish Christmas with a little Jesus. We can put the little bumper sticker on our car. We can have a little ornament on our tree. Jesus is the reason for the season, and there's a big difference from making him the garnish on our Christmas than making Jesus' presence the priority of our Christmas. They went days. How do you lose Jesus? You, you, you come to a point where, right, you know, it's, what's one big deal? I'm just one step away. And then one step away becomes two steps away. And three steps away becomes a quarter mile. And then it becomes a half a mile. And then it becomes a week. And it becomes a month. And that passion and purpose that one time you had, and you're not ever letting Jesus out of your sight, you've made him the center and the point, we begin to drift. They lost Jesus, and they didn't even know it. And let's be super clear about something this morning is the idea of losing Jesus, we think, well, that just happens out there, that happens at the bar or the strip club or some evil place out in the world. Let me tell you, there are a whole lot of people who have lost Jesus sitting in church seats, singing up in a praise band. Hello, pastors like me standing up and going through the religious ceremony, but missing his presence in our everyday, ordinary life. Let's not settle. Hey, let's make a decision this morning as Christ followers. We're not going to settle any longer for style points. And the whole college football thing, I hate that term, style points. I, I, I don't care what it looks like. I want to know, did you win? Are we winning at following after Jesus in my everyday, ordinary life? The power of his presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit living in me, the influence of the word of God over me. I want us to be exactly where God has set us to be, to give him the thanks for the victory that we have in Jesus Christ in our everyday, ordinary lives. What's great and what's good news for us in this whole portion of scripture is when Mary and Joseph came to the point where they realized, Jesus is lost. I don't got him. You don't got him. Mom and dad don't have him. Who died? They went back to the place that they had lost him. I, I, I wonder this morning, where do you need to go back to? Online? Where, where, where's that place? You remember that place where he was, man, he, he was important. He, he was the purpose and he was the passion. He was a priority in your everyday life. We need to make a decision this morning that, listen, I, I'm not going to lose Jesus this Christmas. My family's not going to lose Jesus this Christmas. My, my, my kids, my grandchildren, I'm going to live and leverage my life this Christmas so that Jesus is the center and the point of all that we do and all that we celebrate this Christmas. A conscious presence that God is with us. You know, last weekend we did we had, we partook communion. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 that we're supposed to examine ourselves. We kind of get it, right? We, we would rather look and examine, okay, how is it with me? And we invite the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, how is it between me and, 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 and God, what's going on? Show me any wicked ways in me. I can pivot, I want to return, I, I want to repent. We, we get this whole examination thing. Come on, business leaders, you examine your books. You look at your P&E, right? And you say, okay, what, what, what's my profits? What's my expense? Hey, how much do we make this year? We get it in the physical realm, right? We, um, it's, it's December. I don't know why, but I go to my dermatologist in December. And all year long, right, I'm examining my skin. I like being outside, right? I, I want to be in the sun. And so I'm looking, and I'll go to Linda. Hey, Linda, 
look at this mole right here. Does it, look, does it look the same? And she says to me, it looks the same as it did 10 minutes ago when you asked me, right? I mean, I'm, I'm examining it, right? We, we get it. We, we examine our bodies and you find that lump. You catch it real early, right? That disease doesn't have any opportunity to grow. Hey, how about this Christmas? We examine ourselves spiritually. Where is Jesus' presence in your life? Where was it that you lost him? Maybe you've lost Jesus right in the middle of all your good intentions of celebrating him, going to church, serving him, doing all the things. I know this, when the prodigal son came to his senses, he knew he had to go back home. He said to himself, my, my dad's servants have it better than me. I left, I ran away, I'm going to go back home. And he got up and he went home and he found his dad on the front porch waiting for him. I'm telling you this morning, I don't care how far you've drifted, what you've smoked, who you've slept with, how you've identified yourself. I don't care any of that stuff. I know this morning, if you will go back and you discover God, he's not going to be giving you a lecture. He's not going to tell you how upset or how disappointed he is. He's not going to make you live out in the doghouse for a while. He's going to have open arms and he's going to say, I sure do love you. Welcome, welcome home. So what's an action plan that we can apply to our lives? I want to give you a few things and, um, to set us up to, to live this week. Because here's the deal. I, I, I love teaching God's word. It's a passion of my life. Thank you for coming today. It's, I enjoy teaching God's word to real life people online. I'm glad you're online. I enjoy it. But here's the deal. Sermons are highly overrated. I'll call you tomorrow and say, hey, what did I teach you about? You're going to be like, uh, 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 I, um, you know, you talk about the Bible. <laughs> you say, Mark, how do you know that? Because tomorrow morning, I'll look to Linda and say, hey, Linda, what did I teach you about yesterday, right? I, the sermons are good. They're like a spark plug. You got to have one to get the star, car started, but you want yourself a big old V8 if you're going to go somewhere. You know what I'm talking about? The V8 is how we apply God's word throughout our everyday, ordinary lives. So you ready? Here we go. Some things to write down starts with this. You've got to admit Christ's presence is absent. A problem well-defined is half solved. And we've, just, we, we've got to come to a fresh place where we just get honest that Christ's presence isn't what it should be in our life, that it's, it's absent. The Bible says in Revelations 3 and 16, because you are lukewarm, neither are hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. No, I want you to know, I, I, I love you. I'm for you. I, I, I want to guide you to have your best life today. I'm guiding, I want you to have eternal life, but I want to let you in on a secret. This whole thing of, of, of kind of playing marbles at the foot of the cross, this whole idea that you kind of add Jesus as a garnish to your life, that somehow he's kind of a part of your celebration and he's not, this idea that you can be lukewarm and be a Christ follower, I want you to know it's, it's the biggest lie that anybody's ever told you. There is one way to follow Jesus. It's all in or not at all. Now, I know, I know, listen, you've grown up in North America. I know you're convinced that somehow, that, that, that kind of like going to school, you, you know, God's going to grade on a curve. And at least if you get a C, if, even if it's a C minus, they're passing you on to the next class. Hey, that might be great in your educational life, but it's devastating in your spiritual life. Last time I checked, Jesus didn't go to the cross in a C way not even a B way. He went A way, full to the cross, paying the full penalty of my sins and your sins. He didn't sort of resurrect from the dead. He resurrected fully from the dead. And this idea that somehow we can kind of be in the middle and kind of have one kind of foot because, you know, in the culture and I don't want to offend anybody and I want to, and then one foot over here. Jesus makes it clear in Revelation that he, 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 he ain't going along with that. Someone in between the gatherings sent me a TikTok, and I, I don't know if it came from the Chinese or whoever from the TikTok, but the illustration meant something to me. It's a story of a man who was sitting on a fence. And on the left side, he saw Satan and all the evil and hell, 
And on the right side, he saw God and all the goodness. And he's sitting on the fence. And he wasn't really sure which side he was going to choose. And he didn't choose at all. And the, the devil and evil all left and went away. And God and all the goodness of heaven went away. And it's just him sitting on the fence. He's like, oh my goodness. I guess I should have chosen. <laughs> right now it's just me sitting on the fence. About that time, Satan comes back and he approaches the man sitting on the fence and he says, hey, 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 listen, I, I forgot you. You need to come with me. And the man on the fence said, no, 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 no. I didn't choose you, right? And I haven't chosen God yet. And then Satan said this to the man. Oh, but you have to understand, I own the fence. You don't want to be sitting on the fence. You've got to admit Christ's presence has been absent. When they were asking Jesus, okay, what does it mean? Hey, just teach me. Mark, I want to know. What does it mean to make Jesus Christ? I don't want to be lukewarm. All right, I, what, does it, what does it mean? And here's Jesus' reply. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You're either all in or you're not at all. I love you, I'm for you, I'm for everybody. I'm not talking about losing your salvation, but I'm just telling you, when I met Jesus Christ as my savior in Okinawa, Japan, something changed. It doesn't mean that I haven't done stupid, because I have, but the presence of the Holy Spirit says, Cummins, yo dog, that's stupid. Repent from that, what are you talking about? And then I would repent from that, right? Before Jesus, I didn't feel it was stupid, I felt like, yeah, man, I'm large and in charge. Score, one for me, right? It's not, about, it's not about losing your salvation. It's about proximity. Mary and Joseph had lost his presence. So admit Christ's presence is absent. Here's the second thing, is be amazed by Christ's presence again. Get, get, get amazed, get excited about Christ. Again, Luke chapter 2, to go back to the story. It said when they went back to Jerusalem, everyone who heard him, heard Jesus, they were amazed at his understanding and his answers. But his parents saw them. They were astonished. A better word is perplexed. They were confused. His mom said to him, Some, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Hey, hey which verse are you living in? Are you verse 47 that you're amazed with Christ's presence in your life? Or are you in verse 48, you are perplexed, you are confused? Let me tell you, one, one fail test is Christ's presence. If Christ is found and he is the center and the point of your Christmas, you're going to have peace. And all the chaos that's going on, there, there's a peace that passes understanding. If you're anxious, like mom and dad, perhaps, that is a telltale sign. It's a red flag that somewhere along the line, you've lost him. So Mark, give us a few things. How can we be amazed? I want to be amazed with Jesus again. Let me give you a couple things to write down. Number one is this, is write down the word time. Here's what I know about you, what I know about me. Let me see your, your outlook, your calendar, whatever it is. Whatever's important to you, you give your time to it. I, I, there's no other way. You give your time to what you say is valuable. The average Christian, they tell us from different Barna polls and others, is the average Christian spends about two and a half minutes a day with, with God. Your time. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Maybe the reason you're not finding him is you're not fully pursuing after him now please don't judge me but can i just be honest with you for just a second is that okay you promise okay so like tonight tonight please don't judge me right this is not christianity 101 i'm about to i'm about to confess to you all okay all right so tonight linda and i are going to i'll probably have some popcorn and we're going to watch yellowstone um, it's a new season, it's out. I'm all up into it. I get, I'm, I watch it just praying for Beth. I'm praying that Beth gets saved. <laughs> just forgive me. 
forgive me, but we're going to watch Yellowstone. And somewhere, Corbin, along that time, I'll look over to Linda. It starts, I think, around 8 o'clock. I'll look at her, and it'll be like 10 minutes. It'll be like 8.50, only 10 minutes left in the show. And I'll be like, Linda, I can't believe it. It's almost over. It, it went so fast. What does that say about me? That an hour TV show <laughs> is carnal. <laughs> captures my attention but the idea of spending time in the morning with god i'm like oh goodness okay i know i'm supposed to i don't want god uh, we need a revival in our heart listen you got 28 days between now and christmas you version bible app is a great tool get on it do a, a, a you know a verse a day uh, start in the book of john just read through the book of john spend time with him you and I value where we spend time is, is what we value. Linda's never told me, hey, Mark, thank you. We had five quality minutes together today. She don't say that. She wants quantity of time. That's, that's, like, that's like her thing. Her thing is, man, we're on the couch and watching Yellowstone right and she'll lay down and i'm playing with her hair and i'm just like right, i i want to multitask i want to do other things and right but she she wants that quality hey one of the best ways to be amazed with jesus again is just spend some time with him here's the second thing please let's stay friends after i tell you what i'm about to tell you raise your left hand i do solemnly swear I will promise to be your friend, right? I'm just talking about, hey, I don't know. Maybe you don't want to be amazed. If you don't want to be amazed with Christ's presence in your life, then just ignore me for a little bit. Check the new rankings for the football teams or something. I don't know. But if you want, hey, if you want to be amazed in Christ's presence in your life again, starts with your time, right? We're, we're going to examine our time. Here's the second thing. We got to talk about your cash, Got to talk about our cash. We get distracted, don't we? Make the list of the food that we're going to have. We make the list of all the different people we're shopping for, and we spend all this cash. And I mean, it used to be easy because you had Black Friday sales that actually happened on Friday after Thanksgiving. They started this year on June 13th. <laughs> and if you've noticed, they... They're not done. I get an email. Hey, did you miss it? Still going on today just for you. Like, you liar, liar, liar. Everybody wants your money, right? I, I, this idea of making Jesus at the top of your list, I, I, I want you to hear from my heart. It's not some phony baloney, corny thing from a pastor to try to get money from you. It really isn't. Someone taught it to me when I was a young husband and a young dad and it just made sense the height of hypocrisy the way that you lose Jesus at Christmas it's his birthday the confusion that we give to our kids that somehow Christmas is all about your Christmas presents rather than elevating whose birthday it is they lost Jesus in a celebration of Passover about him we lose Jesus when we don't prioritize our cash. I, I'm for Christmas, I'm for Christmas presents, I'm for all that stuff. M my daughters are grown adults, but they still send me a list. Their list has gotten shorter, but it's much more expensive. <laughs> Boom, right? I'm for, I'm for all that, but Linda and I decided way back in the day, Jesus was gonna be at the top. So in other words, this is what I mean by that. My list, Linda, Emily, Katie, staff you might want to know if you're on that list right you whoever I'm buying presents the sum total of whatever that is I'm giving more to Jesus than the sum total of all those other presents I know some of you're like dang dude you're just you're messing with my Christmas nope I'm trying to get you to be amazed with your Christ again I'm, I'm just telling you that, that not because I'm a pastor, because I'm a Christ follower. 
sometime on your own, talk to my wife, talk to my two daughters, ask them, have you missed out on something? Because your dad made a decision, your husband made a decision to make Jesus the highest. I've, 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 never, I've never regretted it. I love what God's doing at Church of Hope. The check that I'll write at the end of this year for Jesus at the top, it'll be, it'll be greater. So, oh, wait a second, Mark, that sounds like you're boasting. That's not boasting at all. I'm just guiding. I'm saying, here's, here's how I stay amazed at Christ's presence in my life. I, I get it. You might want to give some others, right? That's okay. This Giving Tuesday thing, right? This number here, text the word Giving Tuesday. We will send you a reminder on Tuesday with the direct links that you can give online. What I'm after is you understanding that if you want to see if you want to be amazed, if you're like, here's a line in the sand, I'm not losing Christ's presence. I'm going to make Jesus Christ the center and the point of my Christmas. I'm telling you, you prioritize your time, you give the cash, and you will be amazed. These three different organizations, there's other organizations in our town, other nonprofits. It's generosity, right? So be amazed. Time with your cash, and here's, your, here's the third thing I would give to you, is in, is in your influence. In your influence. Everybody in this room has incredible influence. Please don't tell me that you don't. Everybody in this room has influence. And let me tell you, everybody in this room has at least one person sitting on the fence. And it ought, it ought to be the heaviest thing on your heart and mind. The Bible says it's appointed to men and women once to die after this comes the judgment. There is no grading on the curve. This is the moment for people to discover hope in Jesus. So we have created an event that it might not sound spiritual, but it's, it's a moment in time where at Christmas, not in a church setting, but at a farm where you can invite friends, co-workers, neighbors to discover hope in Christ. And I get it. It's Christmas. And we're like, ah, but we're busy and we got family celebrations. That's one reason why we've moved it all the way to the 23rd. Take away whatever, whatever excuses that we might have. Mary and Joseph could have given all kinds of excuses, but they admitted that Jesus wasn't with them. They pivoted and they went back and they met him right there. It's time for us to understand. And listen, I'm for family. Beautiful family sitting right here, right? Your dad and mom love you, right? How cool is it to even have your kids want to sit with you? It's on the front row. A plus on your paper. Way to go. That's good. Family's important. Would you agree, with fa would you agree family's important? Right? If you put family above Jesus, your family is an idol. I love my family. But let me tell you, Linda, I love you, baby. You're as hot today as you were when I saw you in 1988. But girl, woo, right? But I'm going to let you know something. You're not my savior. Never have been. Thank you for the two beautiful daughters and all the stuff that we have. But our savior is Jesus. And we're going to leverage all the influence that we've got. To those of you who are on social media, right, and you got your little followers, some of you are even called influencers. It's a thing. You're an, you're an influencer. I'm an influencer. And you sell brands and other things. Hey, listen, if you're not influencing people for Jesus, you're a deceiver. You're going to get to heaven one day. Oh, I influenced them to buy these latest shoes. But... <laughs> How sad will it be that people bought your shoes but never knew your Jesus? Let's not lose. Let's not lose. Hey, I'm, I'm glad for your businesses. You got great. Man, some of you are so successful. Leverage your influence. So men and women, boys and girls, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, every social economic status, every human being discovers the hope that they're looking for is in Jesus, and how great would it be this Christmas 
for friends who are sitting on the fence to swing their feet. That was a karate kid kick. How awesome would that be in your life? That one person who's on the fence, you don't know for sure that they would make a decision and follow Jesus. Hey, you've been sitting for a while. Let me, let me pray over you. Corbin's been playing the piano for about 30 minutes. You're like, I thought, I thought that's the sign. Play the piano, the preacher guy's done. Come on, stand with me. I'm gonna pray over you. The Bible says laughter is like a medicine. It's good to laugh. Unless you're an Ohio State Buckeye fan. <laughs> or yeah, you're saying, but at least you're, hey, this is not very spiritual, but there is a life lesson. With a pastor, there's always a life lesson or a spiritual application. Don't ever give up the fight. Don't ever give up the fight for your family, for having Jesus Christ at the very center. Look at your time, examine it. Look at your cash, examine it. And look at who you're influencing, leverage it. Father in heaven, I love you, and I love these precious men and women. Oh, my goodness. It's not lost on me, God, that perhaps someone is even here today, standing in this presence, watching online, that doesn't have a relationship with you. They haven't lost you because they've never found you. If that's you this morning, and you want to start following Jesus right where you're standing Wherever you are online, would you have this conversation? Hey, God, it's me. You're not lost. I'm lost. And today, I believe that you found me. Jesus, forgive me. I've sinned. I've known it. I've been trying to cover it up. I've been trying to fix it up. But today, I ask you, Jesus to come into my life and save me. I believe that you're God. I believe that you paid for the penalty of my sins. And you became alive again. And today, I'm not lost now. I've found you. And God, those prayers all across this auditorium, online, we praise you for the way that you continue to find us and save us. For all of us who are already following you, God, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would infuse us and you would challenge us, that we would inspect our hearts and our own lives. It's so easy to get distracted. Some of us have lost you and until this morning didn't really become aware of it. We admit it to you, God, and we want to be amazed again. God, I pray over these precious men and women, how I love them, and I know you love them even more. May these coming days and weeks as we walk towards Christmas find us in your presence for your glory and for our good. I love you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Peace.